Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, All right, all things considered. Bruce, they got the Oilers axed one of your least favorite players, and you're not super happy? Well, yeah, they made a move. They made some cap space, uh, and we, uh, we can talk about it. But uh, uh, something had to be done, and something was done. So I guess there's that. Yeah. Let me just turn this light on. Oh, I can't. Just trying to get some extra light here. All righty. Um, yeah, they got rid of Zach Cassian in a trade, and we're going to talk about that trade. Mm-hmm. Yep. We'll talk about the order's first pick in the draft, last mm-hmm. pick in the first round. Reed Schaefer. Mm-hmm. We will talk about um, Duncan Keith, Yessa Pugliarvi, um, maybe quickly a little bit about Mike Smith and Evander Kane, although there's that's kind of status quo where we're at, and about the, the order's new um, coaching and uh, managing uh, hires. Let's start off with the big news, Bruce. Okay. The Zach Cassian trade so the Oilers uh Zach Cassian had two years left on his contract yep. 3.2 million dollars this season cap. um he, he cap it yeah he was I, I think it's fair to say at this point a fourth line player earning a lot of money yep. and although he was he was a physical player and that he could st- he still hits he really is um best advised not to fight ever again in the NHL he just keeps getting injured when he fights so that the, the menace of him is a you know that kind of a threat really isn't there and that's part of the reason he was paid is to be that kind of a threat mm-hmm. that kind of an enforcer so <laughs> i thought he had actually played well in the playoffs after um he's had two rather mediocre regular seasons in a row and um yeah, i thought he was okay in the playoffs at the same time that's a lot of money to pay for a fourth line enforcer who no longer can enforce and um, the owners can, you know, they're desperate for that cap space to use another players to, to bring in uh, a, a useful winger um, in their top six and bring in a goalie. And, um, you know, the good news out of Denver today was that Darcy Kemper didn't, isn't signing there. They've told him that they're not going to bring him back. So there's mm-hmm. a couple good goalies on the UFA market in Kemper and Jack Campbell and Billy Husso. So, um, Bruce, what was your take on the Cassian trade? He went, I'll just quickly review it. Sorry, I'll get your take in a sec. He was traded to the Arizona Coyotes with the Oilers' 29th pick in the draft. And the Oilers all, uh, it also um, are sending their second, third round pick in 2024. Yeah. Second round pick in 2025. Yeah. And they, the Oilers... Um, got in return got back arizona's 32nd overall pick in this year's draft so they moved down uh what's that uh, three spots three spots mm-hmm. in this year's draft and they give up these two for future picks mm-hmm. okay now what is your take yeah uh, well it was kind of an interesting contrast because like literally minutes earlier toronto had traded a problem contract to chicago uh, when they got out from under the last two years of Peter Mrazek at $3.8 million, more than Cassian even. And they uh, uh, they took a hit. They traded their number 25 overall for number 38 overall. But that was it. That was the whole trade. Chicago took on 100% of Mrazek's uh, cap and everything. And Toronto moved down sort of half a round <clears throat> as punishment for making a poor signing of Mrazek, who had a tough first year in Toronto and was ready to move on. And then minutes later, the Oilers made a trade where they they got rid of a problem contract that had two years to run at a slightly lesser amount of 3.2 million. They also traded down, although not very far, just from 29 to 32. That mind you, Arizona had so many picks, the Oilers could have probably picked another, you know, from they had a smorgasbord of selections. But then Edmonton went and threw in a third rounder 
uh, two years from now, a second round or three years from now, and just continuing a trend of uh, of uh, of uh, Ken Holland's management style, which seems to be you have a pick, you have a pick, everyone have a pick. We don't want our picks because Oilers just keep getting rid of picks. I wrote a lengthy screed about this the other day when I noted that the Oilers haven't had seven picks in the draft since 2017, which is four drafts in the books. Uh, but tomorrow they're, they're down three picks in day two. Next year they're down a pick. In 2024 now they're down two picks. 2025, three years from now, they're down a pick. They never seem to add any. They just keep giving away picks before they ever pick players. And they're losing trade capital, David. I mean, I mean, Holland had to, I guess, felt he had to use these to uh, correct his mistake of signing Zach Cassian to a four-year contract at a time when, you know, he was hitting the 30-year-old wall that many power forwards hit. And for two years, he got poor value on that contract. And for the other two now, he's got no value at all other than he's had to expend these other assets to make it go away. And that that whole contract has uh, turned out to be a, a pretty major mistake for one of Holland's first signings. Uh, as Oilers GM, and it, I mean, seems, you know, uh, credit. I mean, he recognized his own mistake and he made it go away. But he made it go mm-hmm. away at a cost. Indeed, Bruce. It reminds me of Shirelli, and towards the end of Shirelli's time in Edmonton, it just felt like every single deal he just either paid too much in terms of contract cap hit or term. Or in a trade, he gave up too much. It just seemed like every there was just a little too much every single time. It mm-hmm. was consistent. Yep. And now it feels like this with Holland. So what I'm yep. wondering is, is this just a, is this just the constant experience of the, of the modern fan, you know, armchair GM, like the in every NHL city, we all feel this way about our GM that they that they constantly are giving up too much in terms of draft picks, and cap hit and players oh. in acquisitions or or is it is this something is this actually a problem in edmonton where we have these gms who are slightly incompetent in terms of negotiating and they they just don't drive a hard enough bargain and i, and I don't have the answer to that and i actually don't think that that fans are probably capable you'd have to be a fan in every city and i don't know I'll, i don't know how you'd I'll, measure I'll, that i'll bet you i'll bet you a dollar a whole loony that fans in Toronto are a lot happier with the Mrazic trade than fans in Edmonton are with the Cassian yeah, trade, just in terms of yeah, what it costs. I mean, yeah. they're, they're probably all agree in both cities that they had to do something to create cap space. Uh, but Toronto seemed to get it done for a whole lot less, uh, you know, mortgaging the future than Edmonton. And, you know, I mean, the orders are down seven draft picks now in the future. And all they have that's on their current roster to show for those draft picks is one expensive year of Duncan Keith, which may or may not be played in the end. That's all that they have left in their own assets. All the rest were either to get rid of assets, uh, as in this case, or to to bring on rentals, which subsequently moved on to to, uh, go somewhere else. So, Um, yeah, Kyle Dubas, you know, I think you're right, Bruce. The fans today in Toronto are happy about that deal for sure. And, you know, but he's given up, you know, we, we, we don't keep a close eye on Kyle Dubas. I, I actually like when, when I, when I see a lot of the work that he does, I think I like what he says. I like his attitude about things. Um, and uh, he seems very bright. On the other hand, they have given up like Sean. I know they've given up Sean Jersey and Mason Marchment, correct? In oh. recent years in deals. And so it's not like he doesn't have, you know, they traded, they signed John Tavares I, to this huge contract, which I wonder how that's going to work out for them. We'll see. So it's not like there aren't um, issues with Dubas. And so I can't say, I haven't, I haven't put in the study, but I just, I do have this sense that, you know, it seems like in Edmonton, this is a trend and but again, I don't know. Maybe all the fans feel this way about their GM and that we're, we're just too hypercritical these days on, on everything that happens. I will point out this, Bruce, on this on these, you can actually put a, a value. People like uh, um, Dom Lecician 
and um, from the athletic and uh, bullet blue bullet blue, Brad blue bullet Brad McPherson. Yeah. They do things where they value every pick in a draft. So they yeah. attach a value to it. So this is going on Dom Lecician's of the athletics, his value. So you could actually value, put an act, a number and a, and a draft pick number on what Toronto gave up. So, if, so when you move from 25th to 38th, it's um, the value of that pick in this year's draft was the 58th overall pick in this year's draft. So that's what Toronto gave up, the value of, that's the difference between the 25th and the 38th pick. That has the same value as the 58th overall pick in this year's draft. That's mm -hmm. what they gave up in this trade. Edmonton, depending on how this works out, best case scenario, if the orders are a really good team and the second and the third round draft picks are near the bottom of the rung in each round in those two years, the orders gave up in moving Cassian's contract, which was lesser amount, um, they gave up the value of the 41st overall pick in this year's draft. So mm -hmm. the Leafs 58th overall. Best case scenario, the Oilers on a lesser contract, lesser amount of money, gave up the 41st pick. So so they, they didn't do as well. Now, you could argue, and I would argue actually, that Mrazek, I think, has more value right now as a, as a player than Cassian does. Goalies are hard to come by right now. Cassian really does seem a spent force. Morazic had a bad year. He could easily bounce back to be a league average goalie. So th that's one factor we have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, Bruce, here's the scary thing. If things don't work out and the orders are a weak team and they up end up drafting near the top of the second round and the third round, that that the value of what they gave up at Cassian in the Cassian trade this year amounts to the 20th overall pick in this year's draft. That's what the Oilers gave up then if if those are high draft round draft picks uh, coming up. But that is not, that's a high price to, to move a first round pick to, you know, mid first round pick to move that Cassian. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's painful. And that's a possibility. That's how this could play out. So right. there you yeah, go. So, yeah. So the, the, the entire amount of the exchange would be the equivalent of if Edmonton just singly gave um, uh, Arizona, uh, somewhere between a number 20 and a number 40. Correct. Draft choice. To, that's to right. On. Correct. When you add um, it all up. You might bite the bullet and say, well, that's all well and good. Uh, on the other hand, when you're, you know, you're already short on draft choices, right? I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's a steep price to pay. At least they didn't pay it this year. Like they, this year, they only moved down those three spots. And two guys I like got picked at 29 with the Oilers pick at 29. Of course, that great big huge guy, uh, Lamaru from the Quebec League. Oh, yeah. He was in the Memorial Cup, the 6'7 guy. He got picked at, with the Oilers pick. And then Brad Lambert went uh, number 30. And uh, anyway, the, I'm not sure if that affected Oilers' plans at any at all. It sounds like they liked the guy they got, and they got him. So let's hope he works out. Bruce, let's talk about the Oilers' first pick, Reed yeah. Schaefer. He has been mentioned many times on Oilers now. Bob Stoffer has been talking about how it would be nice to get a player like Reed Schaefer because he's kind of a throwback player, big, tough uh, winger. He's six foot three, 213 pounds, according to Hockey DB. He, he is one of the eldest players in his draft year this year. He's born yep. September 21st, yep. 2003. Yep. So... Um, he, and this is a trend that the Oilers have this recent Evan. years. Evan Bouchard, Ryan McLeod were also um, older players. Some of the two of the oldest players in their respective draft years. I don't know if there's others that you found in your post. I haven't read it yet. There are many, there are many others. There are. This is the sixth time in a row that the Oilers have taken a, their first forward that they've taken as a late birthday, and he's. Uh, uh, just let me find it here. I had it. Anyway, he's uh, uh, Kyler Yamamoto was September 29th. Uh, Ryan McLeod was September 21st. Uh, Raphael Lavoie was uh, September 25th. Uh, Dylan Holloway was September 23rd. I mean, we're talking about four years in a row. The guy was within two weeks of the threshold. Last year, Xavier Borgo was a really young guy at October 22nd. <laughs> like five weeks after the deadline, and now we're back to September 21st. This guy's got the same birthday as Ryan McLeod, 
I mean, if he literally, if he was a week older, he would have been eligible for last year's draft. Uh, that said, he wouldn't have been picked last year because he had zero WHL goals on his entire resume uh, heading into the current season. Of course, the last two years were absolutely destroyed by COVID. Yeah. With, uh, um, uh, one season not finishing, another season barely starting. He spent time in the AJHL, as much time in the AJHL as he did in uh, uh, w. in the dub. And uh, he played, like in his first two years, 25 games, zero goals, three assists. And then all of a sudden this year, he just exploded. 66 games, 32 goals, 26 assists, 58 points, plus 29, 88 PIM. You know, like big numbers right across the, right across the sheet. Playing on a good team. Uh, they said he was on a really good, strong power play, which may have inflated his numbers. I didn't get a chance to parse exactly how many of his points came in in uh, uh, five on four versus five on five situations, but it sounded like a few. And he's a real sort of late riser, they call him. Sort of late bloomer, but a late riser within the draft class. He sort of crept up the charts. And some of the older rankings had him, you know, around number 100, 96, 90. Uh, and only Craig Button had him actually ranked higher than where the Oilers picked him. Uh, Button had him ranked number 20, and Button's famous for having a few outliers in his, in his lists. Uh, and others were close. Mackenzie had him at 37. Uh, a couple of the ones I cited had him around 38, 39, and the Oilers took him at 32. So it's you know not out of line with there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, McKean's hockey had him at 64. Elite prospects at 102. Recruit scouting at 90. Dauber prospects at 55, and so on. Like, but when you've only got one pick, you better take the guy you like. And if uh, Tyler Wright and his cr- crew decided that that was the guy they liked and that was the guy they got then uh, you you know for now there's no choice but to trust their judgment and hope they nailed another one i mean the record is pretty good this scouting staff and let's hope that you know with really one swing in the first 150 picks let's hope they uh they nab that guy yeah i mean he's a big rugged player i mean the orders have had you know they've struggled. You know they've they've often tried to dra- draft that big rugged forward um, in in late in the first round. Um, Glenn Sather tried that a lot. You know he brought in guys like Peter Soberlack or Scott Metcalf or Kim Issel, yep. and and um, Scott you know Allison. Scott Allison. Yeah, there's just a just an endless list. Mm-hmm. And then more recently there was uh, you know. Mitch Moraz and Tyler Pitlick. Um, Pitlick actually became a fairly decent NHL hockey player. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that pick, you know, that was a good pick. Um, so maybe we'll we'll see with Schaefer. I mean, the orders, uh, uh, obviously, they're, they're losing Cassie and they could lose Levander Kane. Schaefer's not likely to make the team next year or, any, or the year after that, like anytime soon, I don't think. But if he's a, if he's a rugged customer... Um, the orders will be looking for that in the next in the next few years. That's for sure. So anyway, I just want to say congratulations to Reed Schaefer, mm. and um, way to go. Hope, hopefully that you hopefully you'll have a fantastic career with the Edmonton Oilers, and hopefully this this pick this 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 group of, of draft um, experts on the Oilers Bruce does have a pretty good record. Yeah. They have had a lot of successes. This has been since um, the 2015 24. You know. Since Nurse and Dreisaitl and then the, the following drafts that came after that, you know, they, they hit big on those first round picks with uh, Dreisaitl and Nurse. And since then, the entire drafts have been, you know, one reasonably strong draft after another, I would suggest. So they've done a good job and let's just hope they can keep it up. It's, it's not easy. Um, it's not easy to get it right. And what you often see is teams will have great runs of, five, six, seven years, and then they'll go cold for a long time. So you need, you do need turnover on that drafting team, and you need a constant turnover on it. And um, we'll see if these guys have still got the energy and the insight to have, have made a great pick here. Sure. I can't hear you. Hey, he's from Spruce Grove. Oh, yeah. Cool. 
Same hometown as Grant Fuhr, another former Oilers number one first round draft pick of a famous past. So anyway, he's uh, uh, he, he does like I I went through a whole bunch of scouting reports and there's some positive, some negative. Uh, what they consistently say is he's got a great shot, really good release, good shot. Can score goals from in tight to the net, or also get them from the high slot. And I saw replays of both kinds of goals. Uh, he's got reasonable defensive awareness, and they used him as a penalty killer in Seattle. And lest we forgot, Seattle made a very strong run in the playoffs and went all the way to the WHL finals, where they eventually lost to the Edmonton Oil Kings in a in a six-game series. And it sounds like, you know, his skating is sort of average-ish and some of his skills are a little behind the curve, but uh, see, he's going to be a bit of a project. He's got one more year of junior and he should be ready to turn pro in the 23-24 season. And uh, it's that'll take time even then. But I guess the idea is that in the long run, they have their, their uh, uh, Zach Cassian replacement, you know, Big strong guy with uh, reasonable skills, and uh, I mean, time will tell. All right, Bruce. There's there's uh, there's been recent developments on Yessa Puliyarvi. Um, Mark Spector reported on Twitter that um, Puliyarvi's agent Marcus Lato, uh, essentially saying that they would like a trade, and that the, the issue seems to be. Pooley RV sees himself as a top six forward, probably wants to get paid like one. And the owners see him as a uh, third line forward and probably want to pay him like one. And um, it's an interesting thing, Bruce, to me, in that he, he there is this huge, um, you know, there's a group of people who, who believe a lot of in uh, nice analytics and they're very high on probably ever they say have the best on ice analytics on the team and he's definitely a top six winger um the market doesn't seem to be strong for him ryan rashog says so far there was about four teams in on him that could be subject to change uh we saw that some very good players like alex de what did he get a mid like a what was it the th- what did bring get seventh pick in the draft for alex de i think and um 739 and a future third rounder and so, fiala got the um like what the 15th got a good, or the 16th yeah he got the 19th and he also got a good pick brock faber uh oh a really that, good prospect that yeah 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 the, a very the L, great. la had drafted with uh uh turns out a pick they got from detroit that detroit got from edmonton and the Andreas Athanasiu pick, that turned out to be Brock yeah. Faber, who wound up being the key asset that landed Kevin Fiala in Los Angeles. So another reason why you don't like giving away draft picks that can come back to haunt you. <laughs> so I don't know why Pulley Arvey's, um value, like there's some suggestion that this value might be low in other cities. I don't think, we know that other NHL teams are involved in analytics if they're using the same analytics as a lot of Oilers fans you'd think there'd be three or four teams like if they really are serious about it who Mm -hmm. would have the same valuation as all these people in Edmonton who love yes the Pulley RV and um there could be a bidding war from these teams like now we'll see if that develops or not they're playing Um, poker right now Dave they certainly are keeping their playing their cards close Playing their cards close yeah. and trying to get uh, trying to get Ken Holland to take a low ball offer, probably. That's what's happening, and maybe not a bad idea if if, if our if our. And we all know that GMs in this league can't be squeezed. Ah, yeah. Well, Ken Holland. So Ken Holland said this week that if if worse comes to like he didn't say if worse comes to worse, but he intimated if worse comes to worse, this pulley already think could drag along essentially all all summer. There might not be any kind of resolution of this. So he suddenly started to play a little bit of hardball there, it seemed to me at least, which is, is good. Send out that message. Don't be too keen to move the player. You know, my own valuation of the player, Bruce, based on our project where we look at mm-hmm. video review of the Oilers, mm-hmm. is that he is a top six winger. Mm-hmm. I I, th- I think he is. And, and um, I don't know what has gone wrong necessarily for Pugliarvi and Edmonton. Maybe this just is a matter of money. 
where they're at, where they're asking too much money overall. And maybe this is also driving down his valuation at a trade. If other teams don't think they can get him on a bargain contract, if they think that this is going to be trouble in terms of signing this player, um, maybe they're not keen to to offer too much for him either in that regard. I don't know. It's, it's a bit of a mystery. You know, there's these constant rumors about McDavid and Dreisaitl not wanting Pugliarvi on their line anymore. Um, you know, we've seen some harsh looks from Connor McDavid to oh. Pugliarvi on the bench. and mm-hmm. and But it's more based on just endless scuttlebutt and chit-chat, the kind of thing. But it's made, an, you know, it's been t- discussed on the radio. It's discussed in podcasts. We're discussing it now because I think it's because it, because it has come up. It doesn't <sighs> seem to be real. It doesn't seem to be, it has the, it has, there's enough smoke there that you start to think, okay, well, there's some fire. It really makes me wonder, you know, when the, when McDavid and Pugliarvi played together this year, the, uh, at five on five, the Oilers scored 21 goals and allowed four. 21 four. And after uh, Jay Woodcock got promoted to uh, head coaching in, f- in the middle of February, from then till the end of the season, when those two were on the ice together, Edmonton scored 14 goals and allowed one. 93% goal share. You think uh, McDavid or anyone would be happy with that? You know, like the goal prevention was was excellent. I mean, obviously they got some saves because it's impossible to keep up that that good of a rate. Of, you know, under a goal against per hour, but it was. Uh, uh, you know, they were really generating the the two-way results, outscoring the other team. I mean, I don't care if they, you know, how many points, how many goals. My concern is which net is puck going into. And if it's going into the other team's net and staying out of Edmonton's net, hey, that's really good, I think. And so that's what a lot of the, you know, the analytics is based on. It's just a simple count of the numbers of what's going on when this guy's on the ice with other players. And consistently, the other players do better when playing with him than they do with anything else. Now, you, in your fine article about Pulley RV uh, reviewing his season, you went into his hard plays at the net. And as you and I know from years of studying these kind of plays, these guys that do the dirty work, that go and do the screens, shake the pucks free, uh, you know, create, drive the net, create lanes. Uh, often they're not rewarded with goals or points, uh, but they're a big part of the reason that that goal is scored. And often the goal wouldn't have been scored without their contribution. And this is, you know, in, in sort of, the, this is where, to me, like people say, well, the eye test and the numbers test are completely diametrically opposed. And I, I disagree. I mean, I our, agree with our, you, Bruce, our, yeah. our, our analysis is based on the eye test. We're watching. What's going on on these plays? Who's doing what? We look at every player in, in the review and trying to determine what what did he do? Was he involved in the play? Was something he did that helped make that play happen? Or on the other hand, is there some way he screwed up that gave the other guys a big chance? And I thought uh, JP looked pretty good under uh, you know both ends of the ice by the way we study the game. And, and that's sort of completely independent from these other on-ice numbers, which also support the cause that... Uh, the Oilers did pretty well when this guy was on the ice, and yet, you know, he did have a weak end of the season. He did have a weak playoffs, and he had, uh, uh, you know, he had he had physical issues that were both uh, injury and illness that uh, uh, that afflicted his play, uh, basically in the 2022 part of the season. And so, recency bias says he's, you know, uh, he's not. He's not quite as good as he showed in the first few weeks of the season when he was frankly sensational. Uh, but um, uh, I he, fear he that whatever deal they playoffs. make, they're going to lose They're going to lose that exchange. Yeah. They're going to lose it in the long run and probably lose it in the short run too. We'll see. I, I, I think whatever, like I think there are a number of NHL teams, let's say there's 10 NHL teams that are dead serious about analytics. Mm-hmm. And I think whatever analytics system they're using, Let's say they're not using on ice analytics at all. They have, I, and I, I really I'm believe that most shocked teams, if they weren't. I mean, well, they'd, be, they'd be using more than that. They have other other no, measures too. No, no, that's too. A, that's my point, Bruce. I oh. think that they're using way more advanced systems than on ice analytics. You know, the publicly available stuff. I think they're 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 watching video. They're breaking it down. They have they have teams of people. They hire teams of people to break it down. They have all kinds of information on every player, which is which is about the individual actions of that player on the ice. And, but I do believe that what, whatever system they're using, I'll be surprised if they don't see value in Pugliarvi, which is equivalent of like, let's say a second line winger at, at worst. Mm-hmm. And, yes, and um, 
so I do actually, I'm, uh, I actually think there is some hope that the Oilers could get value out of this trade. Um, that there are going to be three or four teams that, that actually really do understand what he brings mm-hmm. and are going to be willing to um, bid against each other. And all you need is a couple people to bid and you have a bidding war. So, you know, it might drive up. As, that said, the reason I brought up the, the Brinkett and Fiala, they didn't get a lot for either mm-hmm. the Brinkett or Fiala, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah. That's one of the differences they got it. They're gonna have to really pay to bring it soon and really pay Fiala soon. Um, Pilly RV could be, I think, had for last. So I just wonder if a sticking point isn't Pilly RV's contract demand, and that's something that we don't know right now. Anyway, that's that's looks like it's gonna happen in the next next little while. And we also have the possibility. There's not much to say about Kane. That just seems to be. Hanging in the air. Who knows what's going to happen there? The orders seem to be interested, but but Keith is the interesting one, Bruce, because he may he this is dragging on with Duncan Keith, it is. and it looks like Mike Smith definitely is out, yeah, or or, or you know ninety percent chance he's out for next year, and but it certainly sort of looked like Duncan Keith like there's like it's almost like before it looked like a small chance maybe fifteen percent thirty percent that's what that's what the people who are the insiders were saying like Specter and Stoffer on the radio. That was the range. It seems more like it's creeping up to like maybe 50-50 or 40-60. Like there's a real chance here that for whatever reason, like we don't know his injury situation. Hockey takes a beating on the human body and NHL players get the hell beat out of them as their career goes along and they get ongoing, sometimes, you know, chronic injuries that start to weigh on them. So we don't know what it, what the situation is with, with Duncan Keith. He, my own... He, Recency bias, like I don't think I, I think Pulley was really mediocre in the playoffs, and I think that's really driving is driving down. It's driving the trade talk and also driving down his value a bit. But I also think Keith actually, as the playoffs, he he had a really good few moments against L.A. and Calgary. Man, as against the Avs, he was exposed and um, didn't play so. But you can say that about the Cold Oilers team though too. So. Against the apps. Yeah, well, Pooley Arvey, just to go back to that for a moment, I mean, one, one of his strengths is his forecheck. And yeah. And his, you know, he forechecks like an octopus, right? He's all over the, the puck, and the other guys have trouble moving it, making clean passes to each other. And, uh, you know, they make a little mistake, and it causes a turnover. And if that turnover goes to Connor McDavid, who's the, the, you know, the beneficiary of the second chance opportunity, uh, well, I like the order's chances of converting that into a goal a whole lot more than if this player is, say, Ryan McLeod. And this is where, you know, if you have Foley Harvey down the lineup, well, he's going to be making plays that create opportunities for lesser players. And I mean, uh, you know, even Ryan Nugent Hopkins, uh, for all that he brings to the game, he's not exactly a high, uh, uh, high, highly productive goal scorer. He is yeah, not, you know. especially at even strength. Yeah. So, Paul Yarby's value to me is as a top six forward because what he creates is something you want cleaned up by guys who know how to put the biscuit in the basket. And he, I mean, none better than that, obviously, than McDavid. And so that combination worked worked well, but it worked well in part because uh, those pucks were getting shaken free and those opportunities, those second chance looks were being created. And, I think they have a hard time replacing that, but Me too. I've been wrong before, David. You know what I said the other day? I said the last thing the Oilers needed in the NHL draft this year was a winger. Well, guess what they drafted? <laughs> there you go, Bruce. You know, it's that's drafting. You know, it's kind of tough yeah. to see what they're going to do in terms of positional stuff because, yes, um, you, you know, they have so many players and they can sign players and. This and that and the other thing. All right, Bruce, let's finish off with a, just a quick roundup of the management changes. They, they promoted Brad Holland, Ken Holland's mm-hmm. son, mm-hmm. Um, to assistant general manager. Uh, mm-hmm. He's in charge of pro. He's taken over from Archie Henderson in terms of oh. uh, pro scouting, essentially. Mm-hmm. And they brought back Matson, correct? Mm-hmm. And Gillespie. Yes. yes, yes. And uh, Jeremy Koopel, sure. who has been the video review ace. Got everything right, until even, Kale that, even the one, 
Well, <laughs> until that play, but I'm going to say he got that. Was, that's that's up there for dispute. All right, so um, I don't have much to say about, I, you know, Jay Woodcroft, he knows his coaches. He knows who he wants to bring back. back. Madsen looks like he's done a really good job with the defenseman yes. in Bakersfield. So, um, and in terms of the inner workings of owners management and what Brad Holland does or doesn't do, I have, you know, I don't really know. I can't say um, whether, whether that's, you know, there's, you know, it, it is the GM promoting his son. There is that, that is, there's a word for that. It's called nepotism and it's, it is frowned on and it's frowned on for a reason now, but that doesn't mean that there's, this is a bad move. That doesn't mean that Brad Holland actually might not be a better GM right now than Ken Holland or down a few years down the road or isn't it, isn't going to be excellent. He could be excellent. So he's got that, he's got that burden on him to, so to speak, which would have been alleviated if he moved to another team, but the orders wanted to keep him. They value him. Mm-hmm. And um, there's, you know, what I, what you hear, you, you know, we, we, I saw Darcy McLeod on Twitter mm-hmm. saying that he's Darcy McLeod's an analytics guy, a very smart guy. And he, he likes this, this, yep. uh, he likes Brad Hall. And so there's a lot of uh, kind of people in the analytics community who think highly of Brad Hall and Bob Stoffer has talked about um, how Hall and, uh, tracks kind of individual things like how hard they take the puck to the net, how often they take the puck to the net. He's he's well versed in these kinds of things, um, kind of in the modern, more analytical way of looking at the game, breaking down video. So there's that. And but again, I can't I don't know. I can't say whether he's whether this is a good hire, a good move or a bad move. It's it's kind of opaque to me. Yeah, well, it's, I make the cases you can only call it nepotism when the guy is is not qualified and he gets uh, he gets promoted inside the company. I mean, we've seen lots of family businesses over the years where the you know, you know the kids were as strong or even stronger managers than the parents were, uh, you know, and the, and it successfully changes hands uh, uh, as the uh, in different times because more modern thinking uh, takes place now. Uh, uh, Brad Holland, by all accounts, there was teams interested in hiring him. Apparently, one was thinking of bringing him on as an AGM. And the way to fight that off was for the Oilers to offer him, you know, within the team he already was, a, a, a position of equivalent level. And so they, they made him assistant general manager uh, professional scouting, which is a different title than Archie Henderson's director of pro scouting. And he is... Uh, uh, he is, uh, sorry about that, he is, uh, 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 you know, getting getting pushed up, but uh, uh, I talked to a few people that, you know, I mean, when you listen to Bob Stauffer talk about it, or listen to Ken Holland in an interview, well, obviously they have a vested interest in what's going on, but I talked to a few people that, uh, let's call them independent thinkers outside of the Oilers organization that can be quite critical at times, but are also willing to credit where credit's due. And, and they thought Brad Holland's a strong hire for that position. And all I know is that pro scouting in this club has been a weakness for, um, uh, you know, stretching back a long time, where, for one thing, that it's a really small department. I don't think they had enough enough scouts. Uh, and, you know, and they, they've done some good things. Like, don't get me wrong, during Archie Henderson's time that they, uh, you know, the club has improved. They've moved up the the standings. They made the playoffs three years in a row, and they you know they kind of cleaned up a messy situation that they inherited. Um, but I think raising the profile of pro scouting and making it a you know a, a, a higher profile position in charge of it, and especially with someone who's thought to be a you know a mover and shaker in Brad Holland, uh, hopefully he will drag uh, you know the quality of the pro scouting up with his uh, more modern methodology. And I'm hopeful that uh, uh, that's a move that will uh, uh, pay dividends down the road. And otherwise, all the other guys, like Keith Gretzky, I thought he might be caught in the crossfire. And, you know, you might see uh, Brad Holland as AGM and Keith Gretzky out on the uh, uh, intersections carrying a will work for food sign. But no, he got rehired and he's back in the... uh, AGM and also GM of uh, Bakersfield Condors, which is a role that I think he's excelled at. And so for now, at least, there's just an additional assistant general manager in the 
in the stream and what that means down the road when Ken Holland is ready to move on, who will be ready to move into his place. Well, who knows, but uh, there's uh, uh, going to be some internal competition for that. And uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I like Keith Gretzky. I got nothing against Brad Holland. I wish him well. And I, I think that the, uh, uh, the organization today in bringing back, especially Manson, Goodson, Dustin Schwartz, who almost everyone hates, but uh, the Oilers actually got pretty good results from a, a pretty motley goaltending tandem the last uh, last few years. They have, Bruce. You know, I think the goaltending coach maybe deserves a tiny bit of credit for that. Yes. Uh, rather than seething vitriol 100% of the time, like it seems like he gets from some quarters. Anyway, I don't mind the Dustin, Dustin Schwartz hire. They lost one coach in Brian Wiseman, uh, sort of the third assistant coach, and he's already hooked up with New York Islanders, where he's going to be assistant coach there. And Holland confirmed that, yes, the Oilers will be filling that position and that Jay Woodcroft's actively interviewing, getting permission from other teams to talk to potential candidates. And that's a process, whereas Gulitz and Manson were already here. So that job is now done. The uh, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted and uh, they're on board. I don't know what the terms are or anything else. I think most they kind of go year to year, I think, oftentimes with the assistants. But Anyway, the staff is mostly in place, and let's face it, that staff had plenty of success last year, so I don't think you want too much turnover. There's going to be lots of turnover within the playing ranks of the team, and there's a little bit of, uh, I would call it stability on the uh, uh, front office coaching scouting ranks now. Alrighty, well, we've got plenty coming up. In the next few days, we'll probably be back with podcasts. If there's any big news in the next little while, we'll probably... uh, try to find some time to 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 crank out a podcast so bruce uh thanks for talking tonight all right more draft picks to come tomorrow i'll be at late ones and we'll be writing about each of them in due course as the uh, day goes along thanks again all right thanks for listening everyone and in the meantime and in between times this has been another edition of the cult of hockey podcast <laughs>